Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another edition of Deep Space Updates. And since we last talked, SpaceX has launched 60 spacecraft into orbit on one spacecraft. This was their Starlink payload, the first real launch. They have 60 satellites on it and they were all stacked up vertically. This was the heaviest payload apparently that they've launched over 13 tons. And, you know, it was really interesting to watch this because it went into the usual launch into like a 200 kilometer orbit with an apogee of 450 kilometers, which meant they cruised around for another 45 minutes until they reached apogee. There was a little bit of a circularization burn. And then the upper stage did something interesting. Instead of deploying the satellites one by one, like uh, you would generally see in these things, it instead started rotating around its axis. Now, the way it rotated was the like the point, I don't know, the forward facing direction of the upper stage rotated around the horizon in a circle. And then they were all cut loose at once. And they guess the rotational momentum is supposed to pull them all off and stretch them along the orbit. And 24 hours later, uh, I saw this great video from Marco Longbrook in uh, the Netherlands showing 60 of these satellites just crossing across the frame. It looks marvelous. And yeah, that's great to see this because of course the launch was of course as spectacular as usual, but we didn't really get to see a lot of it. We had uh, signal dropouts during the satellite deployment and we had signal dropouts during re-entry of the booster, which was a shame because it was looking pretty good re-entering at night, generating a lot of re-entry plasma. It was looking great and then we never got to see any of it. But that was the third flight for this particular booster as well and the second flight for these set of fairings. The fairings have been uh, recovered and I will see if they get to fly again. The Starlink satellites are also, well there's some interesting stuff about those. They're all very flat, they unfold in space, they have a single solar panel for their um, power. They are using a krypton fueled a, a Hall effect thruster. Hall effect thruster is just a, an ion thruster, but normally they would use xenon in these. Now xenon is great if you need the maximum amount of thrust for a given amount of power, but if you can spread out your performance or your burns over a longer period, then krypton, it does take more power, but it will of course uh, be about 10 times cheaper and it does give you a little better specific impulse. So this is the first major case I've seen of a satellite using Krypton, never mind 60 of them. Now, I'm not sure what kind of testing we're going to see on these things, but if you look out at the right time, you can see them, them flying over. They're a lot fainter than many other satellites simply because they're really quite small. Elsewhere, SpaceX is now confirmed to be building two Starships. Now we had the one Starship that was being built and stacked in Boca Chica. We also have the Starship Hopper. There is now another one being built in Florida. And that of course then answers the question of how you move them between the places. You don't. You're testing them in situ at this time. Uh, Elon also mentioned that after the end of Game of Thrones, they've decided to switch the number of engines on them from seven to six. That's a Game of Thrones reference you may or may not get. And this marked the reintroduction of the vacuum version of the Raptor engine. That is, a it's basically a regular Raptor, but it has a much longer nozzle extension so that it gets better specific impulse in a vacuum. The new layout, as far as I can tell, is a trio of uh, small engines in the middle with sea level versions. Those will have high gimbal rates, about 15 degrees, so that they can perform the landing maneuvers. And then around the edges of that, there will be the three vacuum engines. Those will be fixed. I'm not sure how they're going to do attitude control. Maybe they only, maybe they only have a very limited range, but those will be the ones that will perform most of the maneuvers in space. So they've apparently built five of the Raptor engines and they are moving ahead with getting ready to test. They think they're going to be testing one of these Starship prototypes with three engines in the next four months. Also, super heavy construction is scheduled to start in about three months. Of course, when I say four months and three months, we are talking Elon time. This could be as late as next year. But you know, obviously we want it to happen sooner, but your reality sometimes sets in and it's no it's not because he, Elon gets things wrong it's because this is always the best possible outcome he's aiming for and I don't blame him for it and 
Speaking of best possible outcome, that's not what they had with Dragon 2. The Dragon 2 area is apparently now cleaned up. We've got environmental people, or SpaceX has environmental people on the ground trying to figure out how to clean up the landing zone. Uh, we haven't heard anything further about the possible cause of this, the or the, any of the, you know, what's going to happen with Dragon 2 um, testing for the, you know, going to the space station. But we have heard that Boeing and their Starliner have now successfully tested their abort engines and their um, reaction control thrusters in space. And as we speak, the, uh, the, the Atlas V, which will carry their first test flight into space, are now sitting on a barge being transferred to Florida. And, you know, this is a crazy turnaround of events. If you'd asked me, you know, a few months ago who was going to get to the space station first with a crew, and it was fairly obvious that SpaceX were doing everything right. And now it really feels like it's turning around and, and there's a really good chance that Boeing ends up beating SpaceX because of the, the setbacks. And it, you know, that's unfortunate for SpaceX, but at the same time, it's good to get any crews back flying on US things as soon as possible. And speaking of as soon as possible, NASA's plan to get people back on the surface of the moon as soon as possible, it continues, although we've had some negative news in the form of the guy that they hired to run this whole effort six weeks ago just quit. And the reason for this it was that Mark Serangelo, he was hired essentially to be Jim Bridenstine's man that was going to run an organization within NASA. This would have to be a new organization mandated by Congress. Congress said, you know what, we don't want to do that. And Mark said, I don't want to work here anymore. And he's taking his opportunities or he's going elsewhere looking for new opportunities. But there are concrete steps happening towards returning to the moon. The NASA announced that they have signed the contract for the first piece of the Lunar Gateway. Maxor Corporation is going to build the power and propulsion element. It's going to be a $375 million project. Uh, Maxor used to be known as Space Systems Laurel. They built geostationary satellites. And the power and propulsion element is supposed to be the core part of the Lunar Gateway. It provides power and the propulsion. It's going to have ion thrusters, it's going to have big solar panels, and it's going to be built around one of their 1300 series satellite buses. Now, they've launched a bunch of satellites into geostationary orbit built around this. They're, you know, five tons or so. I'm not clear how big this is going to be, but they're also going to work with Draper and Blue Origin. Now, this thing is supposed to launch on a commercial launch vehicle in 2022. It'll be no surprise if this ends up launching on New Shepard, sorry, New Glenn in 2022, because Blue Origin are clearly working hard on this. But the power and propulsion element is one small part of a much larger lunar plan, which was revealed in all its glory. It has eight SLS launches and almost 30 commercial launch vehicles. To meet their 2024 plan, they will have EM-1, which will be the SLS demo, EM-2, which will have crew on it, and then they will launch the power and propulsion element, they will launch the mini habitation module for the um, gateway. Both of those will be in commercial launch vehicles. And then commercial launch vehicles will carry the transfer vehicle, the descent module, and the ascent module, which will take crew to the surface of the moon. And then once all that is assembled around the moon, uh, EM3 will be the SLS vehicle that takes the crew up, they'll dock, you'll dock to that, they'll get on board, and they'll go to the surface, and that will be boots back on the moon in 2024, assuming they get the money, assuming everything works, etc, etc, etc. But the plan doesn't stop there, because after that, they're going to be landing people every year, and it'll be three commercial launches to put the three elements into space. They will have, you know, instead of like, instead of replacing all of these, they're going to refuel the ascent module and refuel the transfer vehicle, but they'll still need three commercial launches. And by the end, they will be putting habitation modules on the surface of the moon and the lunar gateway will have got a little bigger. And every year, they're also going to be launching commercial payloads to the surface of the moon under the CLIPS program. So that's how you get up to like 30 odd launches on commercial vehicles. 
The diagram, incidentally, they show pretty much shows Falcon nines for all of the stuff. But I think, I think they're just using that as a placeholder. They're almost certainly going to use other launch providers. But you know, SpaceX is officially part of the Artemis business. It's one of six companies that has been awarded a contract by NASA to study a lunar lander, or the descent module in particular. The others being like Blue Origin, uh, Boeing, Dynetics, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Sierra Nevada Corporation. Moving beyond this lunar program, Virgin Orbit announced this week that they have successfully performed their first full duration engine test. That's 180 seconds for their Launcher 1 engine on their uh, rocket that will fly with a Cosmic Girl, of course. And China, who are on course for launching more rockets this year than anyone else, they probably have had a launch failure. They were launching a Yaogan 33 reconnaissance satellite and they haven't announced success on it, which usually indicates that it failed. But we can't tell for sure. Now, there's a bunch of stuff in the press that shows like a smoke trail going up that's all twisted. That's totally normal. There's other pictures showing debris landing over Laos. Again, that isn't anything to do with a failure because that was part of the original plan. Yes, China will happily drop stages on top of other countries and then give countries money to replace it. However, the most telling thing is that China hasn't confirmed that this was a success and there are rumours that it was a failure. So yeah, uh, that might have happened, but we'll probably not find out very much about it. But India, they did have a successful launch of their spacecraft and I did watch the coverage. I thought it was kind of interesting that the commentator mentioned things like specific impulse, which is something that I'm not used to hearing in regular launch broadcasts. They did also make it clear how India makes a, a lot of effort to try launching their spacecraft where they won't have any chance of hitting any others. I, I mean, that did really stand out in the coverage. I, I wonder why. So yes, space stuff continues and uh, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.